Well, hi, everyone. I'm super excited to see everyone again. I've been in the chat watching you guys talk about the necklace, and I think that we have some agreement on this person. Um, I will say that I wondered, did you like her as little as I did? When I was rereading this story for the class, I was thinking about how I wish you were here at my class, at my house, so that we could trash talk her together. But my mom is watching this, and so I can't say anything mean like that. So let's jump in to the necklace. Now, first of all, I'm curious how you actually felt about it. I mean, I know it's not as good as ice cream, like what is, but you see this picture of this kid with ice cream. And what I want to know is on a scale of one to five, and one is, I just love this story so much. I want to read it again. I, I, I can see myself telling someone about it. Like, I love this class. I hope school never goes back so I can just do this class all day. Like, that's a five. Like, you love this story. And a one is, I hated this story so much. It was the worst experience of my life. And if my dad makes me do this class again, I'm running away from home. So that's a one. So on a scale of one to five, how did you feel about the story? And if, don't worry if it's a one, because I didn't write the story, so I won't be offended. Um, kind of sad, don't you think, Mrs. Van? Yeah, it is kind of sad. We're going to delve into that. Ooh, it looks like some of you really liked it. Yeah, Autumn, we're going to talk about that. Now, you guys, just a reminder, there's a little delay. And so what you're typing and what you hear me saying, there's going to be a difference in that. And that's just the way the technology works. So we got to flow with it. All right. So... Thank you for the um, thank you for that feedback on that, and I'm curious about whether you your number stays the same as we talk about it. So ready to dive in? I'm super excited. Okay, so first let's visit the plot so that we're all on the same page. Okay, so I'm I want to just remind us that when we look at plot, and if you watched yesterday's class, then you saw that this plot diagram that we talked about and all story follows this plot. So I sketched out what I thought plot points were for this story and I'm interested in if my plot points match your plot points. So think in your mind, what do you think what the backstory was? What do you think the inciting incident was? The rising action, the climax and so on. And I have a feeling that we may have a little bit different opinion on one of the plot points. So. Let's see. Now, if you choose something that's different from me, don't worry about it. I'm just a teacher. I'm not the arbiter of all plot truth. Okay, so this is what I think. I think that the backstory, remember, this is just the current pattern. I think the backstory is there's a greedy, unhappy woman who hates her life and resents her husband. That's the backstory. Like, that's what the author is starting with. And then we have the inciting incident. And I think the inciting incident is when she borrows the necklace. And I think that this is the part that some of you may disagree with me. I think that um, I think that some of you may disagree. I think that some of you may think that the inciting incident is the invitation itself. And that's a reasonable thought because the invitation is a common inciting incident. Think about Harry Potter. Right. The, the thing that sets Harry Potter in motion is the invitation to Hogwarts. Um, one of you in your writing responses, which I am going to be discussing some of those um, near the end of class. But some somebody in their writing response wrote about a novel called The Selection, which has got a very similar inciting incident. Even The Hobbit the inciting incident is really an invitation, right? Like an invitation to go on a journey. So often the invitation is the inciting incident, but I think it's the borrowing of the necklace. And the reason I think that it's because it wasn't the party itself that really drove the story. It was the borrowing of the necklace because if she had just gone to the party without borrowing the necklace, the story would have just kind of fizzled out, right? She went to the party and she was mad because she didn't have a nice necklace. The end, right? It's the borrowing of the necklace that is what really, to me, sets it in motion. But if you say invitation, and I see in the chat that some of you do, if you say invitation, I am totally fine with that. Remember, this is just my opinion. So 
Okay, the rising action, she goes to the party and she returns home, right? She, they get back home. So that's what happens. And then we get to the climax. And the climax is, to me, I think the climax is when she realizes the necklace is missing. That's the moment of greatest emotional intensity. Like, oh, the, the necklace is missing. And if you agree with me on that, then this is an interesting story. Because as I mentioned yesterday, the falling action is usually not that long. And in this story, the falling action is lengthy. So you could also make the argument that the climax is the very end, that the climax and falling action and resolution are all conflated into one thing in this story. I think you can make that argument as well. So I'm curious about how you think about climax. So this is an interesting story because the author, and let me say something about the author, The author, you probably thought his name was Guy, but he's French, and so it's pronounced Guy, Guy de Maupassant. So the author kind of plays with the whole structure of plot in a very interesting way. All right, so then falling action, she has this miserable life, paying off the necklace, and it's not just her who's miserable, right? Everybody, everybody's miserable, and then the resolution or denouement that she finds out the necklace is fake. And the reason I say that this is the cli- that this is not the climax is because I think this is the moment of greatest emotional intensity for the reader, but it's not necessarily the moment of greatest emotional intensity for the character, for the protagonist. So it's interesting where the reader and the protagonist have a different a different climax. That's really interesting. All right. Now, I think that um, using the French term for this, for resolution, denouement, is appropriate here because it literally means the untying of the knot, the untying of the knot. And I think that's what really happens, that this, this tangled web that she's gotten caught up in untangles here, which is really interesting. All right. So consider what you think about the plot And I'm curious about how many matches of the six stages, how many did we match on? Like, did you have a different, um, a different inciting incident? Oh, Chrissy, I just saw a comment that you said that you thought it was surprising that she didn't just admit that she lost it. Yeah, I think that's an important point. And I'm going to talk about it later, but let's just, let's just mention that while I'm waiting some, um, some other comments to come in on how you match me with plot is that the cost of the necklace like it's listed in francs and so it's hard for us to understand how much that is but i looked it up i looked it up online to see if i could compare and see how much would that be in today's dollars and i got estimates as high as two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. and so i think if you know you've done something i think it's human nature to um try to hide your mistake. You know, I think we see that. So looks like a lot of us matched on a lot. I'm curious about Hudson with the 4.2. Um, so interesting. Okay, well, let's move on. And I want to start at the end. Remember yesterday we talked about Edgar Allan Poe said that sometimes it's important for an author to start at the end. And in this review, I want to start at the end in the thing that you cannot ignore in this story, right? What you cannot ignore is this mic drop moment. And I went and found my favorite picture of a mic drop, which is President Obama doing a mic drop. And this is the mic drop moment. Oh, my poor Matilda, mine was an imitation. It was worth 500 francs at most. What? Like, what? I remember the first time I read this story when I was in high school and just, I just see, are you kidding me? And remember that the dress she bought was 400 francs. And so the this was pricey, but not, you know, not life ending in the way that 18,000 francs was. So here's this mic drop moment. And I think that what's interesting is that the author doesn't say anything else. I mean, to me, that is such an interesting choice of the author. He just he just stops. He just says, like, here's the end. 
do with it what you will, right? He, he avoids commentary. He doesn't say anything like, and thus we see that greed doesn't pay or anything like that. And thus we see that people who are selfish end up miserable for the rest of their life. He doesn't try to lecture the reader. He just lets the reader take this moment and do with it what they're going to do. I just think it was just, yeah, Peach Jam, I see, you see, that was quite a bra moment. Yeah, you're like, whoa, right? He just quietly closes the story with just a whisper. I just love that. So I'm curious about how many of you felt like you got to this point in the story and you liked it better. Like, Maybe you were just kind of going along thinking, I don't really like this person. <laughs> and then now you read this part and all of a sudden there's some energy in the story for you. So I'm going to pause for a second and see what you guys have to say about that. Oh, I felt like she got what she deserved. Elephant Swift, we're going to talk more about that at the end because remember we're reading all of these stories through the theme of justice. And part of justice is the idea is do people get what they deserve? So thank you. I feel bad for her. And then I read the story again. I'm like, oof, girl. Yeah, Allison, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you. Hardly a quiet ending. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. When I say the author ends it with a whisper, I mean the author is whispering. The author doesn't say anything. The character speaks and the author leaves that. Jake Castle, that's so funny. Are my eyes working? I know it's that moment of just like, oh, it looks like so many of you had that same thing feel like it. Yeah, you love it because you can think about what could happen. What do they say? You know what? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what could have been done differently. I noticed a couple of you mentioned that it's confusing and it is confusing. Like you have to think about it for a minute. Like, wait, did that just happen? Like, wait, what just happened? Um, somebody said that and made you want to rip up your computer. I hope you didn't do that. So, all right, let's launch in to a little bit of close reading. We've looked at the um, ending, which somebody said was an epic gamer moment, <laughs> and we've looked at the plot overall. So we should all be on pretty much the same page. So let's dive deeply into some of the exact text. So there's some interesting syntax choice going on in this short story. And I think that if you're someone, and I know some of you are, if you're interested in writing, this is a really good exemplar text, something for you to really take some strong writing points away from. So get your copy ready. Here's my copy. It's all written up, right? And I'm the teacher and I'm still writing all kinds of stuff on it, right? So you, when you're reading, you need a pen. I mentioned that before, but you need a pen. So this is the fourth paragraph, what you're seeing on the slide right now. This is the fourth paragraph. I want you to count how many sentences this paragraph is. Wait for a second. And some of you will notice that it's fewer than you think. So I'm noticing that some of you are saying that you couldn't pronounce the names in text. Yeah, it's because they're French and sometimes there are abbreviations as well. So it's saying like, it looks like it's saying the word mine, but really it's an abbreviation of Madame. And that's just because we're reading something that was originally written in the French. We're going to talk a little bit more about translation later. It is one sentence. You're right. I'm seeing a bunch of you say, this is one sentence. The entire paragraph is a single sentence. Isn't that crazy? It's absolutely crazy. So let's compare this, this long sentence of narrative prose, right? This is where the narrator is writing. Now let's look at the, the character speaking, the dialogue. Look how short and plain these sentences are compared to the way that the narrator speaks. And with only a few exceptions in the whole story, this is how it goes. The narrator is really eloquent, complex, compound sentences, tons of the sweet 16 phrases and clauses that we talked about yesterday, tons of grammatical interest, and the characters talk like they're in fourth grade, right? Like which there's nothing wrong with being in fourth grade, but they speak at a totally different level than the narrator does. Look, look, look at this. I will look cheap. 
That's the whole sentence, four words. The narrator doesn't have a four word sentence in the whole story, right? So it's interesting to see what does that say, right? So remember that when you see the brain slide, brains on please, it means that you're about to be asked a question and I'm gonna ask you to think. So brains on and, um, oh, I love this insight from, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Kanari Shah, Shah, that her short sentences show how greedy she is. That's very interesting that the way she speaks can be almost a metaphor of her personality. Love that insight. So, um, yes, and you're right. The person who pointed out literary juxtaposition, absolutely. We've got syntactical juxtaposition going on here. Remember, juxtaposition is when we put two things next to each other that are very different from each other. All right, so brains on. I want you to think, why would an author do that? Why would an author have so much disparity between the voices? Like, why why would they do that? Why would they have the character sound so different from the narrator? And I'm curious about what you think, what, what impact that has on the reader. And what does it say about the respect or lack of respect that the author has for the characters that he has them speak that way? I'm looking at what you say. When, I like it when I ask you a question because then I get to go read some more. So... Yeah, somebody mentioned sometimes books in translation can be difficult to read, which is just one more reason to learn another language. Um, I don't actually think she's uneducated. Um, she, maybe she is because it does say in the beginning she was born into a family of clerks. That's true. Yeah, and the disparity is, you're right, the disparity is a key factor in the characterization. Contrast and detail, nice contrast. Several of you are picking up that contrast and a sense of beauty. So Tabitha, I like that comment, a sense of beauty. I think you're right, and I'm glad you picked up on that, that, that the prose of the narrator is beautiful. And then when we're confronted with that short, choppy speaking of the character, that then that beauty goes away and it just shows them even more in kind of the ugliness. They want the people to show you how the character feels. Nice. Thank you. All right, so we are going to look at what I would call a whale of a word. Um, this is another sentence, another uh, technique, a literary technique called anaphora. Now, some of you um, older students will be familiar with this already, but bear with me because I want to show you a couple things about it that you may not be familiar with. Okay, so anaphora is one, of, and that's a big English teacher word. And what it means is when you are repeating phrases, and I'm sorry, if you notice me looking to the side, it's because that's where I have my notes and I want to make sure I tell you what I plan to tell you. Okay, so anaphora is when an author repeats a beginning word or phrase at the start of, it can be a line, it can be a phrase, it could be the beginning of a sentence or a phrase or a clause, like, but anaphora is a re repetition at the beginning then repetition in general is just when something repeats. And so anaphora is a subcategory of repetition. But then I just wanted to throw in one that's not as common and some of you may not know. And I don't know if you're like me. I love knowing the trivia. I love knowing stuff that I think other people don't know. It makes me feel like I'm in on a secret. And that is a technique called epistrophe. So epistrophe is when you do the same thing as anaphora uh, anaphora but you do it at the end so instead of repeating a phrase at the beginning of a phrase or a word or a phrase at the beginning of a phrase or clause or sentence you do it at the end and that's a lot less common so alliteration i see evangeline asking a question isn't that alliteration alliteration is a repetition of a letter right um sally sells seashells by the seashore that's alliteration all right so why would an author use anaphora? Why would they use it? And the same reason you would use any kind of repetition. And there are so many kinds of repetition. You can repeat all, all kinds of different things and they all have their own kind of cool names. We're just looking at these three. Um, so, and I'm gonna give you examples of anaphora in this story. I'm showing you what it is first. So then when you see the examples, you'll know what it is we're looking at. 
So why would an author use an aphra? Well, one of the reasons is for emphasis, because they're going to emphasize what's going on. And another reason is clarity, to make sure that the reader can't miss it, right? Another reason is amplification, to give it more power. Like the author has a way of saying, look, see, this is what I wanted you to know. This is what I wanted you to focus on. This is what I wanted you to see. And then that can also be used as emotional effect, right? If you repeat a word or a phrase that has a deep emotional connection, then that can cause an increased level of emotion. All right, so what I'm curious about is those are some of the reasons for using an aphra. And now we're going to see an aphra in action in this story. And I want you to keep in mind, why do you think the author has chosen this? What is he doing with it? Is he using it for emphasis? Is he using it for clarity? Is he using it to amplify something? Is he using it for emotional effect? What's he using it for? So here's a sentence full of anaphora. In fact, <laughs> let's look deeply at the construction of this sentence. This is a fragment of that sentence we saw before that took up a whole paragraph. And I want to dive deeply into this fragment because it's so incredible. It's got a lot of sophistication, a lot of structural sophistication in the sentence. So we've got the repetition of the phrase, she dreamed, that she dreamed, right? So she dreamed and then again, she dreamed. So that's the first instance of anaphora. But then within that, we've got another example, which is the repetition of all of these of phrases. And these are a series of is a preposition. And so we've got repeated prepositional phrase after prepositional phrase after prepositional phrase after prepositional phrase. And then within that, the narrator or the author does another level, which is that in the last, in the last prepositional phrase of the clause, I have to break down this sentence into so many small parts, but in the last, yes, thank you, Nina, for that, or Nina, however you pronounce it. I'm sorry if I got it wrong. For your example, my life is my purpose, my life is my goal. Thank you. Yeah, that's an example of an aphra. And here we are in the story. So in the last clause, the author puts in the last prepositional clause, in the last prepositional phrase of the clause, puts in a conjunction and then follows the conjunction with something else that another noun phrase that has another prepositional phrase in it. It's amazing, right? So in the first clause that you see here, you see and highlighted in blue, that's conjunction. And then down below, you see the or highlighted in blue, and that's another conjunction. I mean, this is, this is very sophisticated syntax. This is not somebody who just sat down and wrote the story out and thought, this sounds good. This was someone who, who, this is the craft. This is writing as a craft. And when you understand this and recognize it, you like it more, right? You like it more. Because when I read this, I was like, oh, mind blown. Like, look what he's doing with this structure. It's just, just absolutely amazing. So again, why use it? We use it for emphasis, clarity, amplification, and effect. So thinking about overall what the author is trying to do in this story, we could think about what is it that this is accomplishing here by repeating all of this, right? So is he emphasizing the things? So in this particular sentence, what is being talked about is how she, the character, I'm going to look at my own copy of the story here, that when she sits down to dinner, and it says, before a tablecloth that was three days old. I mean, imagine having to suffer with a tablecloth that had been there for three days. But that is what she thinks about. She thinks about all of this. So if this is what she's thinking about at her own table, it's curious to consider what is the author trying to do. And it isn't that you necessarily have to come up with an answer, right? It's not necessarily, there's no one right answer. It's just an idea of you're taking the time in your reader mind to consider, hmm, I understand what anaphora is. I recognize it when I see it. And when I do see it, I'm going to consider why is the author doing this? Recognize that syntactical choice on the part of an author is hardly ever an accident. It's hardly ever just, I think I'll use this now. It's almost always a dedicated choice. Um, so it says, I, I see a question from Elvin Swift. Are we supposed to make these notes on our story copies? 
And Chris, Christiana is exactly right. You can if you want to. So you can print out the story. You can make notes in an online document. It's whatever you want to do. This class is for you. And so do whatever works for you. Okay, so I want to, because we're looking at this, I want to do as our Sweet 16 today. And remember, if you weren't with me yesterday, the Sweet 16 are our 16 tools of writers. We've got parts of speech and we've got phrases and we've got clauses and there are 16 of them all together. And so um, for our Sweet 16 today, I want to highlight the use of the prepositional phrases in the story. So a prepositional phrase is a group of words, not a complete sentence that is made of a preposition and an object. So the object of the preposition will be a noun, but it can be a noun phrase. So it can have an article in it, meaning it, I can say um, of the pond, the is not a noun, right? It's an article, but it, it can be, it's in there. It's part of the object. Okay, so it's a preposition plus an object of the preposition. And prepositional phrases usually act like adjectives, adverbs, or, or nouns themselves. And in this story, we see all of them. We see all of those uses. So those are prepositional phrases. In this, we're seeing most of the prepositional phrases that he uses start with of. All, like if you go through and if you just want something interesting, count how many times the author uses the word of in this story, and it is completely disproportionate to what you would see normally in a story this length. All right, so I want to show you an example of that. Here we see I've highlighted all of, almost all, I left one out, almost all of the prepositional phrases in, in this sentence, right? And we can see by the highlighting how, just how much of it is a prepositional phrase. Like it's just amazing and it takes up a lot of it and it's what makes the sentence so complex so if you are trying to make your own writing more complex using prepositional prepositional phrases is a great way to go especially because prepositional phrases are one of the things that most of us learn the best and easiest and fastest and earliest because a lot of you probably know the preposition song right and so we know prepositions. We're taught them from very early age. And so if you want to strengthen your writing, looking to prepositional phrases is a great way to go. I'm just absolutely loving your comments. All right. So remember, when you see the brain slide, it's time to get your brains on. So I want you to think of this. She thought of the silent antechambers hung with oriental tapestry lit by bra tall bronze candelabra, land of the two great footmen. She thought of the long salons fitted up with ancient silk, of the delicate furniture carrying priceless curiosities, and of. Okay, so I want you to think about that section. If you have a copy of the story, either printed out or online, you can look at it there. We're, we're still there in that little section there. She thought of these things. Now, I want, I want you to try it because the only purpose in learning this is so that you can use it right? So I want you to try it. Imagine, this is what she thinks of. This is this greedy woman living in like middle class and wants to be upper class. And this is what she thinks of when she sits down to dinner. So now I want you to put yourself in the place of a lion in the zoo, a lion living in a zoo. And I'm not at all comparing a lion in the zoo to this character of Madame Loz Lozel. Loiselle, La, sorry, Loiselle. So I'm not comparing them, but parallel lines, things can be similar and still be very far apart, right? That's just math. And so we can say a lion in a zoo is nothing like Madame Loiselle, and yet they still have a lot in common. So if you were a lion in the zoo and you had to say the lion thought of, 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 what are some things that a lion could think of? What would a lion think of in the zoo in a similar way to the way that this character thinks about things while she's in her dining room sitting at her three-day-old tablecloth of, of, of. So I'm interested to see how that goes. All right, so now I'm going to interrupt this program. So I'm going to interrupt the discussion of this story in order to 
teach about a literary element that you have to understand in order to understand this story and actually the story for tomorrow as well because both of these stories and you're going to see it again in other stories too but these stories rely almost entirely on this particular literary device that we call irony. All right, so we're going to look at what do we mean by irony? And I think that most of you have probably learned about irony before. So if you feel that you're pretty confident that you know about irony, I would like you to consider how, oh, I'm seeing some of the lion responses come in. I just love it. Um, so the, I want you to consider comparing what you already know about irony to what I'm teaching you about irony and whether you could think of extra examples of each type of irony as we go by and maybe even share them in the chat. All right, so if you already know about it, share what you know or um, just compare it in your mind, compare and contrast in your mind what I'm telling you about irony against what you've already learned about irony. Okay, so irony is when something comes out of left field, meaning something is unexpected. Something unexpected is said, something unexpected happens, or somebody is aware of something that's going to happen and other somebody else is not. So let's let's show you what we mean. Irony comes in three fantastic flavors, which are dramatic irony, situational irony, and verbal irony. And we're going to look at all of those types of irony. So um, this type of irony that we see here in this meme um, is dramatic irony, where the audience knows something that the characters don't know. This little kitty is peeking out of the end of the covers like, oh, I think I ditched him. But everybody else who's looking at the meme can see, dude, he's right behind you, right? Like, so that's dramatic irony. Lots of times we see this in movies, in theater, where you're like, no, don't go in that room. No, don't go back down that hall. No, get out of the shower, right? Like all the, that's dramatic irony. When you know something and the characters don't know. So when I teach ninth grade English and we do Romeo and Juliet, there's huge dramatic irony because at the end, they both think the other one is dead. They're not dead, but the audience knows they're not dead, right? And it creates all kinds of suspense and you almost want to climb into the story and rescue the person, right? So that's that's dramatic irony. Um, the entire premise of the movie The Truman Show is based on dramatic irony. I don't know if you've seen this movie, but the guy doesn't know that his whole life is a TV show. Well, that's dramatic irony because all of us who are watching the movie, we know he's a TV show and he doesn't know he's a TV show. So that's dramatic irony. And that's an unusual form of dramatic irony where it's like this overarching thing where the whole thing is premised on that. So verbal irony is when you say one thing and you mean another. And sarca what sarcasm is, and some of you like... Sarcasm is just another service you offer, right? Sarcasm. What sarcasm is, technically, is verbal irony plus an attitude. So you're, and, but verbal irony isn't just sarcasm. Verbal irony can also be understatement. It can be overstatement, or it can be something called Socratic irony. Socratic irony is where you know something that the other person doesn't in your conversation. I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a minute. So like you see here, this picture of this woman was bloated. Her. Oh yeah, I meant to do that, right? Or like something goes horribly wrong with your appearance and you're like, oh yeah, I like it that way. Or somebody does a terrible job on something and you're like, that's gorgeous. And it's the opposite, right? That's verbal irony when you're saying the opposite essentially of what you mean. Yeah, I know, I loved that picture. So here's another example. This is Socratic irony. Your mom texts you to see how school's going knowing that you're ditching. Okay, well, nobody could ditch school right now, really. So I guess I guess that's its own dramatic irony. I'm using school as an example and there's no school. So um, that is it though. So if I, like if you come home and your mom's like, so how was school today? And she knows you ditched. Or so how was so-and-so's party? And she knows you didn't go, right? That is Socratic irony. Socratic irony when you know, but you didn't know. Um, or that you know, but the person you're talking to didn't. Um, so here's some more irony. You have an unsinkable ship and it sinks, the Titanic, right? You have a fire station and it burns down, right? That's kind of ironic, right? That the fire station burns down or like when the doctor gets sick, like these kinds of things are kind of ironic. It's like, oh, I should have, right? Like that, that, that's unexpected. Um, here. 
And here is the premise that this story is built on. This premise that the diamond necklace you spent 10 years paying for to replace, right? Um, you spent 10 years play to earn the money to pay back this necklace and it was a fake all along. And that is irony. And in this case, it is what we call situational irony. This is all situational irony. Fire stations that burn down, unsinkable ships that sink, and spending 10 years of your life to pay for something that was only worth, you know, a few hundred dollars. So now we'll return to regularly scheduled programming now that we're all on the same page about irony. Um, yes, I saw somebody say ir verbal irony when you say, I totally meant to do that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so you're, you're seeing the brain slide now, which means turn your brain on. And to be honest, you're going to need them for the rest of the time. So here we go. All right. The irony in the story isn't revealed until the very, very end. I want you to consider how would the story have been different if the narrator had told the reader at the time of borrowing that the necklace was fake. Like if the woman from whom Matilda borrowed the necklace had told Matilda, oh yeah, you can borrow this one. She falls in love with it like, oh, you know what? That's paste. And paste is a term that they use for necklaces that were made essentially of glass. Like it wasn't real diamond. So, um, so I want you to think about that. I'm going to look at some of your responses of irony. I love that. Um, a water park is burned to the ground. A tow truck breaks down. That's nice. Could I put my video face in the top right corner? I could, Heidi, except that if I did that, it would block text because I created the slides to be able to make sure there's space for the face in the bottom right. Sorry. Um, a math teacher who fails calculus. Yeah. Sometimes, though, that can make you better at it, right? Um, yeah. Okay, now I'm looking at this. How would the story have been different? You wouldn't have been shocked. Yeah, I wonder if you think that would have strengthened or weakened the story. Um interesting. She wouldn't have wasted 10 years of her life. Yeah, you're right. Actually, would there have even been a story? Yeah, somebody just commented. It would have been boring, right? Like there would have been no story. The whole story hinges on people not telling each other the truth. The whole story hinges on her not telling Matilda that the necklace is fake and Matilda not telling her she really lost it. Without those two lies of omission, the story falls apart. Interesting. Oh, boy, your comments are coming in. I, I can't. They're just so interesting. All right. So let's do a little close reading. All right. So she suffered endlessly. She suffered again. We have with again with the anaphora, right? She's suffering. She's suffering. She's got servants and ugly curtains. I mean, don't we all feel sorry for her? This woman like invented the idea of first world problems. This is her own brand of situational irony. She doesn't feel that this is what she expected or deserved. And because of that, it's situational irony. Like it's ironic that even though she's born into a family of clerks and she, she, like, she marries this guy who's this, also a clerk, a minister, right? She, at a ministry, she feels like she deserves so much more. Like her whole situation is ironic. Like, isn't it bizarre that I live in this situation where, um, I am not appreciated. I'm not given the things that I deserve, right? Um, so she suffered and she suffered because of this. It's so, it, it, it's hard to read, isn't it? It's hard to read. So I'm curious about whether you think suffering is easier or harder to bear when it's self-inflicted. Because in this case, I think you can make the strong argument that her suffering is entirely self-inflicted. Like she is somebody else's hashtag goals, right? to live in a house with servants, to even have a tablecloth, to have what she has. This is, this is somebody else's, like my ideal of the big time. And yet she's suffering. She's suffering. So I'm curious about what you think about this, because if you inflict the suffering on yourself, which I think you can make the argument that she does, is that easier or harder to deal with than if the suffering is inflicted on you? Like, is it harder to come out of it? Is it harder to move past it? I think that's really worth um, exploring. I loved Michael Phelps drowning as situational irony. Yeah, I mean, we don't want him to drown, obviously. But yes, that would be obviously the greatest Olympic swimmer in history. Yeah, nice. Um, I'm loving what you're saying. Harder, harder, harder. That 
so many of you are picking up on the idea that suffering is harder when self-inflicted. It's so interesting. And I think that one of the things that would be worth doing after class is to consider, are there any ways in your life in which you are making yourself suffer needlessly, kind of like her? Are there things that somebody else might look at your life and you're complaining about something in your life and somebody else would be feeling about you the way that we're feeling about her? I'm interested in what one of the person says that when when you inflict the suffering on yourself, you have it's harder because you have suffering and you have guilt. Very interesting. And you can't blame anybody but yourself, right? Yeah, true. So, and then this is that three-day-old cloth next to her, right? Now, we're being a little bit manipulated by the author here. By throwing in these kinds of details, the author is forcing us to loathe and disdain her. And sometimes we don't like that, right? Like sometimes we don't like it. I don't know if you've ever watched a movie where they almost make you root for the bad guy and you don't like it. Like you don't like being manipulated that way. Um, you can't help but disdain this person. You're like, really? You're upset about that? And it's important for readers to recognize when is the author manipulating you? And when she gets invited to the party, Instead of being delighted, as her husband had hoped, she threw the invitation on the table resentfully. I was wondering about this, if you've ever given someone a gift and had them respond badly and how you think her husband feels in this moment, that he comes home thinking, I'm finally going to make her happy. Like she's going to get invited to this party with all the big wigs. Like surely this will do it. And yet she just tosses it. It's so interesting. It's one of the things I think that's interesting is that the author chooses to leave us totally in the dark. The narrator is a third person narrator. The narrator could tell us what anybody else is thinking, but the narrator chooses only to tell us what what is going on. Later, the narrator tells us what he's thinking. Um, in one instance, when she asks him for the dress, we get an insight into what he's thinking. So the narrator could absolutely have told us what he was thinking right here, but he but but the narrator, narrator doesn't tell us. And I'm curious about why you think that might be. Like, why not tell us what he thinks? I wonder if it's because he thinks it's just so obvious or if he wants the reader to work at it a little bit. I don't know. It's a curious thing. Now, because then look at what it follows up with. If I give you money for a dress, then I won't have money for a gun. He doesn't say that to her. He doesn't say that to her, but he thinks it. And that's when we get insight into what he's thinking. So we don't understand how he feels about the invitation, but we do understand how he feels about the dress. I, just as a peek at our justice theme, let's consider that she has to ask him for money. She has to ask him for money to buy a dress. Like she doesn't even ask. You know, like she has to wait for him to offer. And yet if he wants to buy something, he doesn't have to ask her. So I'm curious about how much of her greed, how much of her self-obsession, how much of her social climbing was a result of the society in which she lived. Like that that she was, I don't want to say victim, but that she was a product of the way that her society viewed women in general, especially women of her station, and that she was caught in this weird, like nebulous limbo. It's interesting. So then... Later, three days go by, husband says, what's the matter? You've been acting strange these last three days, right? Again, this short, choppy dialogue. I'm upset I have no jewels, not a single stone to wear. I will look cheap. I would almost rather not go. And I'm like, oh, come on, right? Oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. When she goes, when he thinks about it, why don't you borrow something? And she goes to visit and she looks through all the jewelry. We get another big Bam! With the greed, right? So in one version, one translation version, she asks, haven't you got any more? When the woman's like showing her all the jewelry that she has that she could borrow, she, Matilda's like, don't you have any more? In another translation, you have nothing else, but it's still like, don't you have anything better, right? And this is just so interesting. I'm curious about what you think about which one of these makes her sound worse, right? 
Jay Sand, I see your point. He still gives her the money. He wants her to be happy. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, well, I don't know. I, oh, mm, I don't know if she, he wants her to be happy. I know he wants her to shut up. I don't know if he wants her to be happy. I know he wants her to stop complaining. They're not necessarily the same thing, right? Um, but I think you're on the right track there. So, and then it says, she fled with the treasure. Ah, but here's something interesting. Is it really treasure? Nope, <laughs> right? We think it is, and the reader thinks it is, and Matilda thinks it is, and at this moment in the story, the only person who knows it's not treasure is the person who loaned it to her. Everybody else is in the dark. It's the second time that the narrator is kind of fooling us. So I'm curious, do you think that Madame Forcier should have told Matilda that the necklace was fake? Like when she said, oh, um, you, you um, want to borrow that one? Okay. And just, hey, I know it sounds crazy, but it's fake, right? It's not, it's not real. So don't worry about, you know what I mean? Um, so that's kind of interesting. Do you think that Madame Forcier should have told her it was fake? And setting aside what it would have done to the story, just as an ethical question, ethically, should Madame Forcier have told her it was a fake? If you loan somebody something, should you, and they, and you know that they think it's one value, do you feel like the person should tell that it is a different value? So at the party, she's a triumph. It's everything she's hoped for. It's everything she's wanted. And in order to celebrate that, what we get is more anaphora, right? Um, that she was success. All the men stared at her, asked her name, tried to be introduced. All the cabinet officials want, like everybody wanted her. It's like, it's like de Montpassant is like a one trick pony. Like the author is like a one trick pony. It's like an example from a textbook. Like he sat down and said, let me write a short story that will use a lot of anaphora so that English teachers have a great story to go to when they want to teach it. I mean, it's just like that. Look at again, here we come again to um, a lot of these prepositional phrases. And this scene right here, she danced wildly with passion, drunk on pleasure, forgetting everything in the triumph of her beauty, in the glory of her success, in a sort of cloud of happiness. I mean, you really, I mean, he pulls you in to this world she's in right now, right? And this is the climax of her story. And this is interesting because the character has a different climax than the reader. Because the character has this climax of the moment of greatest emotional intensity. This is the highlight of her life. Absolutely, we know, now we know that this is going to be the best day of her life. Never. She, she's not going to have another day like this. This is a moment of greatest emotional intensity for her. But it's not the moment of greatest emotional intensity for the reader. And that's really interesting. So... It says that she would not listen to him. He wanted her to wait while he went and called the cab. She wouldn't listen to him and ran down the stairs. And when I read that, I couldn't help but think of Cinderella. And I'm curious about whether you can pull some parallels between her and Cinderella. In what ways is she like Cinderella? And in what ways is she different, right? I think one of the most ironic things in the story overall is that de Maupassant puts their house on a street called the Street of Martyrs, when this woman is just such a martyr to her own unmet expectations, right? So it's like the street itself is a metaphor. The first time I read it, I literally laughed out loud. I said to myself, oh, I see what you did there, right? Like That's so interesting. And pick up on these clues. Authors don't usually choose names of things or places by accident. They're trying to say something there. All right. So then we get some foreshadowing. And you only know it's foreshadowing when you're done, except that I will tell you that I did pick up on I thought, huh, why did he put that in there? And it's the scene where they go to the jeweler to say, with the box, remember that she she still has the box that the necklace came in because she didn't take the box to the party. So she goes to that jeweler on the box and says, hey, this is a necklace I borrowed. It came from here. And the jeweler says, oh, no, I didn't supply the necklace. I only supplied the box. That's foreshadowing because the close reader should pause here 
and recognize a disturbance in the force, right? This goes back to Poe's idea of plot and how the story is connected within itself because we know at the end we realize, oh, the reason it was in that box was because it was fake. Like it, that necklace didn't come from that box. She was using the box of an expensive jewelry store. It's like putting something from Walmart in a Tiffany box. So that's really interesting. Now, one thing I want to point out is that in French, the story is not called the necklace. The story is called La Peru. I'm not, I, you know, my mom speaks beautiful French. I wish she were here and could pronounce it for us. But this word in French, la, it's probably paru, um, is means a set of jewels or ornaments. And I'm curious about whether you think about why would you translate it, the necklace, instead of the set of jewels? I wonder, like, and I think that it highlights one of the difficulties of reading and translation, which is that we sometimes lose something because the idea of a set of jewels is really interesting um, and, and considering that. So if you are ever reading something in translation, then it's important to go look and see what was the author's original title. And you get that in translation even from like the UK because Harry Potter, the Harry Potter one was not called the Sorcerer's Stone. It was the Philosopher's Stone in England. And so it will be different titles even in different countries divided by the same language. So here's this moment. It's so ironic. She takes the necklace back and she says coldly, you should have returned it sooner. I might have needed it. And it's like, <laughs> it's, it's not even the necklace that you lent her, which normally would make you matter. But here she is getting irritated by the fact that she loaned something to someone that was worth 500 francs and she got something back worth 36,000 francs. And she is complaining. But it's all, it's all irony because nobody knows. Like, she doesn't know that it's not the necklace she lent and the, and the, um, and Matilda doesn't know that it was fake overall. And there's this, I mean, it's just the readers is like, this is just, anyway, I just think it's awesome. I just love that part. I just love that part. When she gets mad, I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Okay, so again, do you think she should have told her it was a fake? Now, the Loiselles, do you think she should have told her it was a fake then when she brought it back late? She, she said it was a fake then. So she had another opportunity to tell the truth. All right, the Loiselles work for 10 years to pay off the necklace borrowed for a single night. And can you imagine an experience so amazing that it would be worth 10 years of your life? I, I don't think I could. Now, I'm curious what you think would have happened if she hadn't lost the necklace. I mean, who knows? Who knows? And this is what the author asks us. This is the only time in the whole story that the narrator does. If this were theater, it would be called Breaking the Fourth Wall, where the narrator stops being involved in the story and turns out to the audience and says, hey, I want you to think about this. How life is strange and changeful, how little a thing is needed for us to be lost or to be saved. And whenever an author does this, it is a clue. This is what I want you to get out of this story. I want you to focus on that. And this is the one time in the whole story where the author does it. The author says, what would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Right. So interesting. And then the last line of the story, when all becomes clear. Now, question for you. If you were Madame Loiselle and you ran into her on the street and you said, I've been working for 10 years to pay off this necklace, would you want to know the truth? Would you want to know at this point that the thing you'd work for 10 years for was worth almost nothing? Or would you want to be kept in ignorance? All right, so looking at it through a theme of justice, do you think that the punishment fit the crime? And I'm curious what you think the crimes were. I think you can make the case that there was a crime of um, greed. I think you can make the case that there was a crime of not being honest, that you lost something. Because she didn't even give her an opportunity to tell Matilda that the necklace was fake because she didn't tell her that she'd lost it. So there's a lot of sin of omission going on here. And I'm curious about who else was punished besides the person who committed the crime. So this is where justice comes in here. Does the punishment fit the crime? 10 years of your lives, both you and your husband. 
All right, so now back to our one through five. Do you think, what do you think about the story now that we've discussed it? Is your number the same? Has it changed at all? Okay, because you always want to do that. When you read a story, the first time you read it, think about how you feel about it. And then after you dive into it more deeply, think, oh, and it doesn't mean that you like necessarily the plot better, but do you feel like there's value in the story? Has your sense of value in the story gone up? Okay, so in our last few minutes, let's learn from some writing rock stars. So I'm going to share some examples of people who submitted writing from yesterday. I was so blown away by them. Thank you so much for submitting them. And I just am so, I'm amazed. I put comments in cinema. I'm going to show some of them. So let's learn from some writing rock stars. So first I picked a couple samples from students through eighth grade. So this student is a fifth grade student and this fifth grader gets total kudos from me for responding to the prompt so well. It's one of the most common mistakes that students make, which is to not respond to the prompt. They write something beautifully and they get really upset when they don't get a good grade. And the reason they don't get a good grade is because they didn't respond to the prompt that was asked. This student responded to each section of the prompt. Now, the, this prompt asks three things. And the student responded to them, bam, bam, bam. If I'm a teacher and I'm grading this, it's like so easy for me to see, yes, you responded, yes, responded, yes, responded. So nicely done. One of the things that the author of this did, this writer did that was really nice was that um, the writer responded to every section in a really concise way, which is lovely. And also notice this line, all of this contributed to it being so interesting. So the writer uses the examples and then tells what effect the examples had. And I just wanna give you a gold star, nicely done. Now, how could you make this even stronger? Well, you could create a little suspense in the opening. You could say something, for example, like rebellion and surprise create an interesting plot, right? You could, you could do that. That's a stronger opening than the most interesting plot, right? So you can create a little, a little strength there in the opening. All right, here's another example. We've got um, this writer, this writer is 13, says, states your point, plot does this. Now you could even strengthen that sentence by making that opening stronger by cutting out the has enormous potential part. You could cut that entirely out and just say, plot reveals characters and allows the author to describe worlds. Now notice how she follows that up with an example of exactly that. So she states her opinion or he, I don't know, I think it's a she, it's a she, states her opinion and then follows it up with examples from the text. Beautiful, supported it, lovely, well done. I'd change that conjunction probably. That conjunction there that says but, I'd change that to and um, because you're not introducing something in opposition but rather in addition. Now one small note, her use of the word antagonist rather than the name of a character is really nice. It adds some universality. I don't have to have read the book in order to connect with what she's saying. I know what an antagonist is, and so I understand what she's saying. So great job. Next, here's another fifth grader. This blew my mind. So this is an absolutely astonishing example of what I mean. I not only want to read what the student wrote, but I, I want to go reread this book. Look how this starts. Imagine a snowy plain, a chilling chase. The snowflakes whoosh into your face, first gentle, then harsh. I mean, well, that's the plot of the Golden Cup. Like, that is amazing. So do you see how this writer just captures you right into the writing? Like, I'm already feeling it. The, the writer created a mood right away and caught me. So that was beautifully done. All right, let's look at examples from ninth and 10th graders. I chose this one as an example because I love the parallel structure that uses a transition word to clue the reader in. So remember, you write to be understood. If you write and your reader is confused, you've lost your mojo. Like that's not what you're going for. You speak to be understood, write to be understood. So notice how the writer sets this up. These two things are similar and then describes the incidents in both stories. I love seeing that word similarly um, to show the connection. And in fact, I noticed so many of you who had strong writing used good transition words. And I noticed it so much that I uploaded a transition word handout into the main folder for the course. And so you can download that if you want um, or save it to your own Google Drive um, if you want. I have this big, long transition word handout showing what different transition words do because they're the best. 
Um, now, a couple places this could be stronger. You can take out the I think. We know it's what you think because you're writing it, right? So you don't need to tell me I think because it's redundant. It's uh, I know what it's what you think because it's what you write. Um, it's a given because you're the one writing it. So if you need to say something and you think people might have a different view than you, like they might disagree with you, then you could say it can be argued that or readers could consider or something like that. But you can leave out that I think it 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 it's a, a weak beginning construct. But otherwise, love this. Um, and then this is the same writer. And I recognize I'm right at time. So if any of you have to go right now, but I've got a few more, just a couple more examples I want to show and give you the info for tomorrow. So I also appreciate how it creates a sense of despair and easier said than done kind of situation. I love this. I love how the writer, who's the same as the last slide, that the person tells me what it does. Your writing should always answer, so what, right? Love it. Next, 11th and 12th grade. This is a 12th grader. And this question was about, are stronger readers less dependent on plot? And and this person, it this isn't the beginning of what the person wrote, but I want to start here because this writer, a 12th grader, isn't just responding to the prompt with a generic response. This writer is using specific examples, like this is a kind of plot-driven story, and then now here's this other kind of story. And then, of course, I just can't help but not be in love with that beautiful semicolon, right? Just absolutely lovely. Um, a little thing, when you're talking about people, use the pronoun who rather than that, right? Um, who responds to people, that responds to objects. All right, next slide, this is the same writer. Um, and here, there's this lovely transition word that clues me in that the writer is about to shift gears. This phrase, hardly worth writing about, is so intriguing. I mean, by definition, we're writing about stuff that was written, that was published. And so the writer's showing that this is really a thing. Nice. So see this comparison that the writer makes? We're told about the other kind of plot, and now we get an example of the alternative kind. So super great, strong example here. And then it continues with this. Um, then again, it could be argued. Do you see how she says, in doing this? That shows the result. So... This writer has got so much going on, throwing in an additional argument. Like, not only am I responding to the prompt that I was given, I'm going to add in another additional argument. Like, I'm going to take this even further than you expected me to take it. So when you can say something like that and support it, that's beautiful. Like, that's the writer's craft. That is sophisticated writing. And if you write something and you don't understand why you're not getting the grade that you want, consider the idea that teachers have to leave room in the grading for the students who took it even further, right? So nice. All right, so um, let's, let's see this. So, oh, you know what? I think I didn't, let me go back to this. Um, yeah, no, I think that's right. I just love it. Oh, so good. All right, so let's write. What are our prompts? Time to be cool like this guy. What are our writing prompts for today? Now I need to go here and move my video down a little bit. Let me adjust it so you can all see. All right, so our prompts today. If you are up through eighth grade, come up with another solution for how the Loiselles could have handled the loss of the necklace. Rather than what they did, what could they have done instead? I cannot wait to read these. Um, and tell me, what do you think are possible outcomes because of that? If you are a ninth grader or a 10th grader, then I want to know how the story would have been different if it, if, um, from the perspective of the reader. Like, how different would the reading experience have been if you had known all along that the necklace was borrowed? It looks like maybe it's not moving me. Hmm. Off. Okay. Oh, you know what? Let me try on this one. I We had a little weirdness with the, um, we had a little weirdness. There we go. All right. Believe me, we've been working on learning this tech. All right. So if you are in 11th and 12th grade, then what I want you to tell me is to argue that the husband and wife deserved each other. I want at least two direct quotes from the story and one paraphrased quote. Right, so two that are in quotation marks and one that's a paraphrase. And I want you to include two prepositional phrases in a single sentence, right? Big challenge for you 11th and 12th graders. So a lot of syntactical challenge. If you are in a lower grade and you would like to challenge yourself, try to do some of that syntactical choice that I'm asking of those 11th and 12th graders. Include those 
prepositional phrases in a single sentence. See if you can do it. All right, now, how we upload this is the same way as yesterday, which is that you put it in the um, folder. Oops, let me do this. You put it in the folder. And I know there were some issues with uploading yesterday, and I'll tell you what happened. Yesterday, someone, not us, changed the setting of the folder and made it so that it wasn't visible. So um, don't adjust settings, right? We've left this open so that everybody can share and upload and create, but don't mess with the settings in these folders because it really had an impact on people. So upload it here into the necklace. Upload your writing there. And then your writing for tomorrow, or I'm sorry, not writing, your reading for tomorrow is um, The Gift of the Magi. Oh, so beautiful. A Christmas story, but uh, with a timeless message. I'm curious in The Gift of the Magi, if you know, whether you think about the way that irony is handled in that story versus this one. So be thinking about that. And I promise way more likable characters, way more likable characters. So I will see you tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel, 12 o'clock central time and about an hour of short story goodness. And I will be going over more of your writing tomorrow and I'll be in the folder commenting still on some writing. So some of you got comments from me for your writing yesterday and some of you will get more coming up and some of you, it might take just a few days for me to get all caught up on that. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you tomorrow.